Okay. Among the liturgists and theologians, it is generally considered true that each form of ritual embodies a kind of spirituality which is proper to that ritual. For example, the Eastern rites tend to emphasize the mysterious aspects of the spiritual life, as well as the role of icons in promoting devotion to our Lord, Our Lady, and the Saints. The ancient rite of Mass embodies a spirituality and spiritual lessons which can appeal to every generation and time. By ancient ritual is meant that rite which was codified by St. Gregory the Great and underwent a very slow organic development over the course of centuries. The last missal promulgated which enjoys that organic growth is the ritual of the Mass of 1962. It is the common perception in the Church today that the actual liturgical development during the medieval period was in fact decadent and that we must return to the apostolic and early church period in order to know what real liturgy is and to know what God's will was regarding the liturgy. This is, however, I think, a fundamentally flawed notion. Aside from the fact that the modern liturgical experts, and by modern I mean within the last hundred years or so, were not accurate in their understanding of the liturgies of the early church period, the notion that the liturgical development in the medieval period was somehow an aberration is really a rejection of what was an authentic development based upon the understanding of the Mass as sacrifice. Moreover, they like to hearken back, the liturgical experts, to an era when the liturgy was, quote, pristine, unquote, and by that they usually mean their inaccurate interpretations about the Mass as a meal in the early church. My point is not to give a history lesson, but to state that one of the premises which this conference works from is the fact that the ancient rite of Mass is actually the product of the hand of God, who used saints throughout history to develop it according to his holy intention. And it seems to me that the desire to reject our liturgical patrimony is really a desire to reject those things which God has done. Insofar as it is the work of God and the saints, it embodies certain spiritual principles in the very nature of the ritual which are worthy of reflection. Obviously, we cannot go into them all, but I should like to limit myself to the discussion of four, namely the awareness of our sinfulness, the need for self-denial, perfection in virtue, and lastly, certain aspects about prayer. All of these are essential elements in any sound spiritual life. The first is, again, our, an awareness of our sinfulness. The ancient rite of Mass starts with the prayers at the foot of the altar, which begins the Mass by the priest orient himself to the altar, that is, the altar of his youth. The altar is, of course, the place where the sacrifice for our sins takes place. And the priest asks God to judge his cause, that is, his cause is a just one, in contrast to the unholy people. Immediately, there is a clear understanding that there are good and bad in the world. Since the confiteor is required at every Mass, the ancient ritual makes it clear to us that we have sinned. A bit more, okay. Confess, okay, the ancient rite of Mass is that we have sinned, and the priest and later people confess their sin not just to God, but to the whole heavenly court. That is, the priest and later people confess their sins in order so that they may uh, understand their own sinfulness. The priest himself must confess his sins independently of the pre people, as an example for the people, but also as a sign that the priest needs to be keenly aware of his own personal sinfulness. The priest asks to be washed and forgiven repeatedly throughout the ritual in order to foster a sense of humility and unworthiness before God to perform the function that he does. No priest who takes a prayer seriously can be overcome with pride. As the priest ascends to the altar, he asks for the sins of the people to be taken away. And then as he reverences the altar, he asks specifically that all his sins be pardoned. There is, of course, the Kyrie, asking for God's mercy. And later before the Gospel, he asks again that his heart and lips be cleansed. Perhaps, however, aside from the confeder, the most notable recollection for the priest for his sins is contained in the offertory prayer, the Sushipe Sancte Pater. The priest says during the prayer that he offers the, the spotless host to, quote, atone for my innumerable sins, offenses, and negligences, unquote. It is necessary for the priest to con constantly remind himself of his sinfulness and his proclivity to evil so that he will be motivated to root the sin out of his life. It is also necessary for the priest to do this so that he recognizes his unworthiness to offer the sacrifice and the need to be pure and holy so as to offer it worthily. Since the first step towards sanctified perfection is to be aware of and admit to one's own sinfulness, these prayers are highly important for our spiritual lives as priests. 
none of us who are aware of the scandals and the sins in the last 40 years associated priests should desire that these prayers be taken out of the offertory. The lady must desire that the priest be sinless. And one of the ways that is facilitated is to recognize in the prayers at Mass that he is offering this Mass not only for the people, but for himself. If a priest has a sensitive conscience and knows that he must remain pure for the sake of offering the sacrifice, then he merits more graces from God for the people. Today people say that as long as the Mass is valid, it doesn't really matter what the state of the priest is. While it is true that a priest does not have to be in the state of grace to validly offer the Mass, nevertheless he has an obligation to be as holy as possible in order to merit more for those under his pastoral care. There are two kinds of merit in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The first is our Lord's own sacrifice in which by the hands of the priest he has offered an expiation for our sins to God the Father. Here we are referring to the fact that the Mass is the participation in the sacrifice of Calvary, and the merit flowing from this sacrifice is infinite, since that which is offered is infinite. But in addition to this essential or primary merit, there is a secondary merit which flows from three things, namely the holiness of the priest, the holiness of the people who join their own particular sacrifices to the sacrifice of the priest, and three, the ritual itself. In order for us to gain more fruits from the Mass, we must do everything we can to aid the priest in being holy. For example, by offering our own prayers and mortifications for him, so that he will obtain a holiness of life. But this is only possible when the priest is constantly reminded of his ability to fall into sin if he does not rely on the grace of God. It does not help us to ignore this reality and remove it from the ritual. Rather, the awareness of our sinfulness is absolutely necessary. For our spiritual advancement and for the ancient ritual, it is not lacking in this regard. The word culture comes from the Latin word cultus. While our subject does not allow us to go too far into the discussion, we should be aware of the fact that the cult, that is the liturgy or rituals of the predominant religion, actually determines the culture of the society. We have seen this historically during the Protestant revolts, and we have seen it in our own lifetime. That is, when the church changed the ritual of the mass, the Catholic subculture in this nation collapsed. The point here is that if we want to transform our culture, we must have a ritual which has a keen awareness of our own sinfulness. If we expect our society to have an awareness of sin, the priest, when he approaches the altar, must have a sense of his own sinfulness. Since all graces come into the, into the world by means of the Catholic Church, if our ritual is not meriting the most it can, then we are actually affecting the world by the very ritual which we perform. The second spiritual aspect of the ancient ritual, which is manifest in a number of ways in the Old Rite, is the sense of self-denial and mortification. One of the clearest manifestations of this self-denial is the silence in the Old Rite. When we, speak, when, when we meet someone who has the vice of loquacity, that is, the vice of talking too much, it is usually because the person is full of himself. It is a fact of human nature that any time we do something this is in accord with our, that is in accord with our spiritual, disp or, excuse me, our physical dispositions, we get a certain pleasure from it. For example, people often talk about being in the mood for certain things and not others, and when they get the thing that corresponds to their mood, they experience a certain pleasure in it. Talking is much the same way. The appetites can become attached to talking, and this is precisely what the old right militates against. By requiring the silence of the people, you provide an opportunity for the appetitive, appetitive desire to talk to be stripped from those who attend the Mass. I have had many discussions with a lady who come to the Old Rite for the first time, and they often find an appetitive revulsion to the ritual because of the silence. They, of course, do not express it exactly that way, but as they talk it becomes clear that they do not like the fact that they are not being talked at and not doing some of the talking themselves. St. John of the Cross used to say that before he would enter into mystical contemplation. His house, as he called himself, became all quiet. And by this he meant that all of his appetites and faculties quieted down. This is a sign to us that we must be quiet. We must be stripped of self in order to ascend the heights of perfection, and the old mass aids that understanding. Moreover, it teaches us that we don't have to be the center of attention by talking in order for the ritual to have a deeper meaning and significance. The old ritual also fosters a sense of detachment on the side of the priest and the people because the ritual is completely determined by Holy Mother, the Church. We see in the Old Testament that God gave very detailed instructions 
on how he was to be worshipped. This is key in understanding the liturgy in two ways. The first is, is that the liturgy is not our action. It is the action of God by means of the priest. It is not something we do. It is essentially something God does. For the consecration cannot take, take, take place without God, who is the first cause of the sacrifice. Cardinal Ratzinger talks about this in his recent book on the spirit of the liturgy. The second way is that it is God who determines how we will worship him, not us. This has been one of the most notable failings in modern times. That is a desire to determine for ourselves how we will worship God. But it is erroneous because it is up to God to tell us the type of worship which pleases or displeases him. And therefore only he should be the one to determine the ritual. I mentioned earlier that God had fashioned liturgy over the course of time through the saints who were filled with love of God and everything they did came from him and led back to him. The old rite teaches us an important spiritual lesson that if we are going to be holy and pleasing to God, then our task is not to conform the not to conform to the uh, then our task is to conform to the liturgy and not make the liturgy something of our own doing, that is, make it conform to us. Furthermore, since it is God who must determine the ritual, we learn that the Mass is not about us, it is about God. We are only a secondary aspect of the rite, and this is made clear in the ancient ritual by taking the control over the liturgy away from us so that we recognize it is not about us. While our desire is to benefit from the Mass, our benefit ultimately must be referred back to God. That is, we become holy because it gives God greater glory. So even the aspects which affect us are ultimately about God. By determining how the ritual is done each day, it provides two, in, two important spiritual things for the priest. The first is peace. For he can go and conform himself to the will of God by following the rubrics of the Mass since they are predetermined. As a priest, I cannot say what a great sense of freedom this gives. He does not have to fret over what he will choose and say because he is worried about what the congregation may think. He does not have to listen to the liturgical committee trying to tell him what to do. The second is it teaches the priest self-denial and sometimes mortification when the ritual is out of his hands and when it becomes very difficult. The Mass is not about the priest. It does not have to be sustained by his personality. Obviously, only a priest can offer the Mass, but he can lose and forget himself when the whole ritual is determined by the Church, which is the Vox Dei, the voice of God. It makes it possible for him to forget himself and everything else so that he can perfectly enter into the mystery and sacred realities present and thereby derive the greatest benefit from them. In a most perfect fashion, he acts in persona Christi, a term used a lot today but rarely understood that is, in the person of Christ, because his own person personality is minimized and he can become more like Christ. Since he says Mass facing God and not the people, his own personality, or lack thereof, is not what sustains the ritual. He is able to let his own personality fade into the background so that he can concentrate fully on attending to God. Here we talk of service. The priest serves, serves first and foremost God, insofar as he tends to God in the sacred liturgy. Too often when the term service is used in conjunction with the priesthood, it usually means some type of social service, rather than its real meaning, which is service to God. The Old Mass has only two kinds of options, both of which are heavily regulated. The first is that on certain days, under, according to certain conditions, votive Masses can be said, but that is something exterior to, rich, to the ritual, not interior to the ritual. The second is that under certain circumstances and on certain days, predetermined optional prayers may be added to the propers, for example, to pray for rain or peace or something of this sort. But these are heavily regulated so that the priest understands that while he may choose to do them, when and how is not entirely up to him. The point is, is that options within the ritual should be minimized so as to foster obedience to superiors self-denial, and the reduction of self-will, all of which are necessary in the spiritual life. If many options are allowed, it actually militates against the priest's self-denial, and it fosters self-will, since the ritual becomes subject to his choice. It also leaves him with the impression that the real liturgy is really his doing, rather than an action performed by God through him. Lack of options teaches the priest detachment, and it also teaches the laity self-denial, 
because they know they cannot manipulate the priest since it is out of his hands. Detachment is key to any discussion of the liturgy and any sound spiritual life. But modern man has lost all detachment regarding the liturgy, and he is constantly subjecting it to his appetites. But we need detachment, and any discussion of liturgical restoration requires that people first detach themselves from what they want so they can know what God wants. Furthermore, the multitude of options and lack of detachment in liturgy has led to a type of immanentism. Immanentism is a philosophy or notion which holds that everything of importance is about us and comes from us. If it isn't from us, then it has no meaning or significance it holds. Immanentism comes from the two Latin words in and monere, which means to remain in. Since man is incapable of reaching the heavens on his own, Babel and the Pelagian heresies have clearly demonstrated that, the liturgy must be from God and about God in order to draw us out of ourselves and to have any sense of the transcendent, the striving for which is deeply rooted in the heart of man. The ancient liturgy, liturgy also provides a depth to one's spiritual life for three reasons. The first is that it takes us out of ourselves and brings us to God. If we remain in ourselves and if we fashion a liturgy which is at our whim and about us, then we are doomed to shallowness and superficiality. Rather, insofar as the liturgy is out of our hands, we recognize that it is beyond us. It is mysterious. And insofar as it is about God, it can forever be contemplated. The second is that it is founded on tradition. Tradition provides a mechanism in which man can abandon himself to God who fashions the tradition over time, rather than taking control of it ourselves and jettisoning the tradition. In other words, tradition provides a mechanism by which the spiritual and liturgical patrimony of the saints can be given to each generation who can use it to their spiritual benefit. Like someone who does not know his historical roots and therefore does not know himself, Modern man has chosen to reject the liturgical tradition and replace it with himself, only to be lost in self and never truly to understand himself. Tradition provides a way for the young to ground themselves in the wisdom of the past, and this not only applies to cultural things but to the liturgy and spiritual life as well. The third thing which the ancient liturgy provides is repetition, a dirty word by modern uh, standards. Now, modern man has rejected repetition, and that is because he is fixated on novelty. Novelty, of course, gives our appetites delight, but it is not the basis of depth. To enter into something in depth requires time and repeated considerations of a thing. Well, repetitio mater descendi, as we say in Latin, repetition is the mother of learning. And this not only applies to learning in general, but to our spiritual lives, that is, learning the things we need to learn, in our spiritual lives as well. By repeating a prayer, the meaning of the prayer becomes more known to us and therefore is able to be entered into more perfectly and with greater depth. Since the ancient rite does not allow for novelty but repetition, it provides a way in which people can focus on the mysteries present rather than the new things which are constantly popping up. With the silence quieting our faculties and the repetition of each Mass, we are able to more perfectly enter into and participate in the mysteries of the Mass. Too often participation is equated with physical activity rather than the higher and more active form of participation, which is spiritual participation. Novelty also begets spiritual gluttony. By spiritual gluttony is understood the spiritual defect by which one takes delight and concerns oneself only with the physical and spiritual consolations sent by God, rather than using the consolation merely as a means to growing holier. In other words, the spiritual consolation becomes the end rather than God. Spiritual consolation must be a means. Spiritual gluttony occurs when people do spiritual religious things because of some consolation, the light they get out of it, and so the delight becomes the end, as I just said. But novelty begets spiritual gluttony because people tend to think that newer is always better, and so each new thing brings them some new delight. Here we see that novelty can easily degenerate into keeping people entertained. But the danger is that insofar as it prompts one to stop looking at God and fixating on the new thing that sates our appetites, it impedes our spiritual growth. All of the saintly spiritual writers warn that spiritual gluttony is very dangerous for the spiritual life. The ancient ritual actually destroys spiritual gluttony on three levels. I'm sorry I'm a Thomas, I always have to make these distinctions according to numbers. The first is, all of the silence takes away from our appetites the desire to talk. 
It is a fact that some people like vocal prayer because of the, quote, spiritual high, unquote, to use a degenerate 60s and 70s terms, term, in, in doing the talking. Second, by the repetition, the appetites, which constantly want something new, do not get what they want, since repetition in a spiritual good is something seen as desirable only on an intellectual level, not on an appetitive level. Our appetites or desires can get bored when we experience the same thing, whereas the intellect is able to see the value of the thing each time it encounters it. Thirdly, there is a certain pleasure derived from being in control of something, and this is why the ritual must be fixed or determined by the church and not by ourselves. For insofar as the ritual is determined by our choice among the options and not the universal laws of the church, we get a certain pleasure in being in control. But this is subordinating a spiritual good to our natural desires. Moreover, while it is not part of the newer rituals themselves, some of the forms of music employed in the newer rituals are actually used because of some sensible or appetitive pleasure derived from the music, rather than the, uh, the music drawing the mind and will into closer union with God. This leads people to confuse the pleasurable experience with actually experiencing God. In effect, it leads people to think that authentic experiences of God are actually always pleasant, while in the next life, they are. In this life, the experience of God is often arduous and exceedingly painful for us, not because of some defect in the way God handles us, but because of our imperfections and sinfulness which causes our pain. As St. Teresa of Avila once said, God, if this is the way you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. The point is, is that music and all of the other aspects of the ritual should be geared toward weaning people off of sensible delights and consolations as the mainstay of their spiritual life. This is why Gregorian chant, which has an appeal to the intellect and will, naturally begets prayer, which is defined as the lifting of the mind and heart to God. Gregorian chant does not appeal to one's emotions or appetites. Rather, the beauty of the chant naturally draws us into contemplation of the divine truths and the mysteries of the ritual. To return to our discussion of the options, by having a predetermined ritual by the universal laws of the church, one avoids having one person force his disposition or his own spiritual life, or again lack thereof, on the rest of the people attending the Mass. In other words, it avoids having someone impose himself or intrude on the spiritual life of the laity by the choices he makes which flow from his own interior dispositions and spiritual life. Since people are naturally dispositionally different, when the ritual becomes the product of one individual or even a few within a group, it loses its spiritual appeal to the rest who do not share the same dispositions, whereas the ancient ritual avoids this by determining the ritual itself. This ensures that the liturgy remains authentically Catholic. By this I do not mean the often heretical things that are introduced nowadays by priests who should know better. Rather, I mean that insofar as the options flow from a particularization of the ritual, it ceases being Catholic in the universal sense. One of the advantages of the ancient ritual is that it does not matter which parish you go to, it is the same. In fact, in an age of hypermobility, it seems imprudent to have changed the ritual at all. I realized this when I went to Rome and attended Mass in Italian. Had the Mass been in Latin according to the ancient rite, I would have felt right at home at the Mass. But instead, I was left with the impression that I was merely an onlooker from the outside, to use a modern liturgical phrase. This is why Latin and a fixed ritual allows the Mass to have a universal appeal because one can attend it in every country, every parish in the world, and still feel right at home. While we may not understand the homily or the sermon, nevertheless, one can enter into the ritual in the same depth and fervor that one can at one's own home parish because the Mass is the same. This also avoids the unfortunate problem of people parish shopping, which, of course, was verboten in the old rite, uh, I should say in the old code, because they are trying to find a priest whose choice of mass options fits their own dispositions. Latin also provides a form of self-denial by taking the translating of the ritual out of the hands of questionable agencies. Inclusive language is a classic example of what I've been describing, namely is the desire of a small group to impose on everyone else their own spirituality. The desire for inclusive language is a manifestation of the expectation that the ritual should conform to them rather than they to the ritual. Latin destroys this because, as Pope John the 23rd says in Vitrum Sapientia, all people are equal before the Latin language. Latin forces a type of self-denial on us. 
because we can't manipulate the language to our own ends. It voids the inclination of the priest to ad lib by foisting his own personal disposition on those attending the Mass. Instead of making the Mass something painful to attend because of its particularities, it should be something of joy into which you can go to Mass at any time and know what you're getting. Furthermore, the Latin, the fixed rubrics, all of these things strip us of ourselves so that we can become nothing. St. John of the Cross often noted that we must, we must be nothing so that God can become everything in us. Or as in the words of St. John the Baptist, which has already been quoted today, we can apply them to the ancient ritual. We, or I, must decrease so that he may increase. Stripping ourselves of self, which the ancient ritual does, is a requirement for any authentic spirituality. Which brings us to the next topic, namely perfection in virtue. The old mass, insofar as it strips us of, uh, of self, it humiliates us. Now, every one of us suffers from pride, and so this humiliation is necessary. Moreover, by not allowing us to have control over the ritual, we will not go to extremes in our actions, and this begets meekness, which is the virtue by which one does not go to extremes in one's reactions or actions. I have heard countless stories of laity and priests being furious after attending a new ritual because of what the celebrant did. The priest should not be the cause of anger during the Mass, and by being the cause of anger, the priest actually erodes the meekness that is the virtue of the laity. Having a fixed ritual, provided the priest follows rubrics and says it uh, Mass reverently, minimizes the chance that the priest will anger the laity, and so the old rite assures meekness. Humility is the root virtue in the concupiscible appetite, that it is the thing in which inclines us towards bodily good. Humility, which I was very delighted in Dr. Hildebrand's discussion of it, it was very beautiful, is the virtue by which one does not judge oneself greater than he is. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us it, it is the root virtue of all the other virtues, and no other virtue can exist without it. The old mass roots out pride and begets humility, because it is not our action, our product, but the product and action of God. Moreover, by coming up against the mysterious which for us in this life is insurmountable, it naturally causes in us a sense of our littleness in comparison to God. This, in turn, tempers the way we behave because we are in the presence of someone who causes awe, which is an overwhelming feeling of wonder or admiration. Awe naturally causes us to stop and to consider ourselves in the light of, the, of that which is awesome. Ultimately, it captivates us and moderates what we do because we're captivated in the thing that causes awe which means we're not going to be doing strange things. We're going to be focused on it. The ancient ritual in begetting humility and meekness upon which all of the other virtues rest reminds us of the words of Christ who said, Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. In other words, I conform myself to the truth. I am not proud and do not judge myself greater than I am. I do not go to extremes in my reaction. And this is why we must desire, and this is what we must desire in any ritual. And that's what you almost hear when you hear the ritual being said. The ritual should speak to us not in our own words, but in the words of Christ, and in the ancient ritual, this can be seen to be speaking metaphorically, learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Once meekness and humility are in place, the virtue of reverence naturally follows. Reverence is the virtue contained under the more universal of justice, and more particularly religion. It also has a place in, in another place, but primarily because of the focus of our talk, it has to do with here in which one holds in honor and esteems something, some thing, something usually sacred in this case. The ancient ritual helps us to honor those things which are holy because, first, we are humble and recognize the greatness of sacred things. Secondly, we approach God in a sense of self-denial and subservience, and in this respect, the ancient ritual excels. For the priest bows his head, genuflects, and humiliates himself often in the prayers so that God will look upon his actions and be pleased. Fortitude is also taught in the ancient ritual, if for no other, in no other way than the fact that it is clear that this is spiritual warfare. At the very beginning, when the priest vests by putting on the amice, he says, which is inter inter interesting because the amice is now no longer required in the new mass, which makes you wonder if they really think this is spiritual warfare or not, he says a prayer in which he asks our Lord for the helmet of salvation so that he can fight off the incursions of the devil. Also, since the priest is not subject to a liturgical committee in making decisions on what should and should not be done, it strengthens the priest and reaffirms the masculine aspects of being a priest. Here, I would highly suggest you read, if you have not already, 
the article by Father McLucas on the emasculation of the priesthood, which was in a former, um, uh, uh, it was in, is in the Latin Mass magazine, where he recounts that newer rituals have in fact taken away from the priest those things which are masculine, namely to provide and to protect for his spiritual family. He gives the example of providing for his spiritual family by the fact that in the ancient rituals he alone feeds his spiritual family by giving out Holy Communion. This also means he can protect the sacred mysteries. If the laity are handling it, he has no way of controlling it or protecting the sacred mysteries. The systematic renewal of all these things which emphasize the masculine and fatherly role of the priest has weakened our vision of the priesthood. Moreover, we tend to get what we place before people as an example. And by this is meant that if we place before people a weakened view of the priesthood, which has little or no virtue, virtue of fortitude, then we can expect priests to become and attract seminarians who are weak and effeminate. Fortitude is defined as engaging the arduous good. And the ancient ritual provides an avenue for the priest to obtain the greatest type of fortitude, which is the most difficult, that is, self-discipline through self-denial, because we ourselves are the most arduous thing to overcome. The ancient ritual also avoids violations of justice. Now, the New Code of Canon Law states that the lady have a right to attend the liturgy set according to the rubrics. Uh, they constantly talk about the age of the lady, but you never hear them talking about that one. Now, all of the options have eroded the sense that the priest must en render to the people their due, because the flow of the Mass is at his discretion. This leads the priest to think that he can do whatever he likes in the ritual. While the Church documents are clear that he cannot do that, the fact is that all these options contain an implicit principle, which is, do what you want. This is why when the ritual is out of the hands of the priest, it naturally begins a sense of the requirement of justice in all of us, not just the priest, but the people as well. For when the priest does something which is contrary to the rubrics, or even in the rubrics but is optional, it gives people a sense that the priest is not concerned so much about what God wants, but about what he feels like doing or wants especially if, one if the one attending the Mass doesn't like the particular option that the priest has chosen, that pressure is really strong. Ultimately, the ritual of the Mass is about God, and so the ritual ought to seek the best way of rendering to God his due, and this comes through a deep sense of justice. Through the sacrifice to God and the conforming of the ritual to that sacrifice, we recognize that with respect to God, we have no claim of justice insofar as we are mere creatures. Therefore, the Mass must be about God and not ourselves. And the ancient ritual helps us to forget and lose ourselves in the rendering of justice to God through the sacrifice. The ancient rite begets faith, hope, and charity. It begets faith because it excels in its expression of Catholic theology. Faith comes through hearing. And we hear the faith in the very prayers of the ancient ritual. I need to stop here a minute. I, there was a friend of mine whose dad, he actually came into the church by going to the old mass because he looked at it just once and he said this has to be from heaven this was in 1962 well 61 excuse me in six, when they changed it he said he felt robbed he didn't go to mass again until the adult was allowed now I don't condone that but the point is is that faith comes through hearing and if the mass is preaching the faith we'll have converts if it's not we're not going to it begets hope the ancient ritual does because of the deep sense of the transcendent and our participation in the transcendent it begets charity because it helps us to realize that worship is about God, not us. Charity is defined as love of God and love of neighbor for the sake of God. Even when we love our neighbor, it must be for the sake of God. This is what the perfection of that virtue consists in. Hence, the ritual helps us to focus everything on God, which gives a proper direction to our spiritual life. Even if this were not the case, the ancient ritual begets charity if for no other reason than it keeps people's imperfections at bay by taking away the ability of one person to impose himself on another, and therefore anger and hurt feelings and the like are averted. The last aspect, which we will have to suffer through in this conference, is ascendancy in prayer. We have already mentioned the silence which is necessary to ascend the heights of prayer. While it is not required for vocal prayer, it is required for mental prayer and the other seven levels of prayer. Most people never get beyond the first two levels. If you get a good chance, you should read Jordan Allman's uh, Spiritual Theology. He lays out all nine levels, and most people never get beyond the first two. Now, St. Augustine said that no person can save his soul is if he does not pray. Now, it is a fact that mental prayer and prayer in general has collapsed among the lady, and clergy for that matter, in the last 30 years. 
it is my own impression that it actually has to do with the ritual of the Mass. Now, in the newer forms of rituals, everything is vocal prayer and the communal aspects of the prayer are heavily emphasized. This has led to a notion in the minds of people that only those forms of prayer which are vocal and communal have any real value. Consequently, people do not pray on their own anymore, whereas the ancient ritual actually fosters a prayer life. By this is meant that the, that the silence during the Mass actually teaches people that they must pray. By this is meant that the silence during the Mass, either one will end up, because of the silence, end up in constant distraction, or you'll actually get down to the business of praying. The silence and encouragement to pray during the Mass actually teaches, the, teaches people to pray on their own. While strictly speaking, they are not praying on their own insofar as they should be joining their prayers and sacrifices to the sacrifice and prayer of the priest, which of course are different, it is done interiorly and mentally, and so it naturally disposes them toward that form of prayer. This is one of the reasons why after the Mass is said, according to the ancient ritual, people are naturally quieter and tend to pray afterwards. If everything is vocal and out loud, then once the vocal stops, people think it's over. It is very difficult to get people who attend the newer forms of the ritual of the Mass to make a proper thanksgiving by praying afterwards because their appetites and faculties have been habituated into talking out loud. The ancient ritual also gives one a taste of heaven, so to speak, since the altar demarks the dividing line between the profane and the sacred, between the heavenly and the earthly, and the priest ascends the altar to offer the sacrifice, so it gives us the impression of ascending into heaven. It leaves one with the sense of being drawn into heaven with the priest. This naturally draws us into prayer, and it gives a sense of, tra of the transcendent and supernatural, which are key in the spiritual life. The numerous references to the saints fosters devotion, rather than minimizing it. The Latin gives a sense of mystery. The beauty of the ritual, the surroundings which naturally flow from the ritual itself, such as the churches which are designed for that ritual, because the ch uh, church is always designed for the ritual, so the strange looking churches you see, they're actually designed for a different ritual. The chant, all of these things lead to contemplation, the seeking of that which is above. I won't go on since people have a natural threshold of being able to absorb what you say, which is usually about five minutes after you start talking. Clearly, we have not exhausted all the spiritual aspects of the ancient ritual. But these four areas which we have covered show us that the ancient ritual and the newer forms have different spiritualities. If the church is to capture the sense of the transcendent for the laity, if they are to have humble and saintly priests, if we are to have a ritual which is driven by charity and therefore has God as the sole focus of our longings and desires, it must restore that liturgy which God himself fashioned both when Christ was on earth and through the loving hands of the saints throughout history. We cannot be satisfied with a liturgy which is the work of our own hands, and for this reason I do not subscribe to the theory that we need yet another ritual. We need the work of God back, because if the ancient ritual does anything, it teaches us that we do not need our own self-expression. We need God. <laughs>